beginning, there was darkness, and then, bang, giving birth to an endless expanding existence of time, space, and matter. Now, see further than we've ever imagined, beyond the limits of our existence, in a place we call the universe. What if the forecast predicted high winds 10 times the speed of sound? An evening downpour of sulfuric acid rain? Or a hurricane two times the size of Earth lasting 300 years? This is not the stuff of a science fiction movie. These are actual weather reports from around the universe, and it's Earth's weather to the extreme. We are counting down some of the biggest, baddest, weirdest, and wildest weather the universe creates. Fasten your seatbelts, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. This is the universe, wildest weather in the cosmos. Weather is the state of an atmosphere. We might think we've got it bad on the third planet from the sun. With vicious thunderstorms, oppressive heat, and temperatures so low, they're sometimes unbearable. But weather here is a walk in the park compared to weather elsewhere in the universe. Rain, wind, and storms take on a whole new and strange meaning. And while the mechanics that power these weather events are strangely similar to Earth's, the results are terrifying to contemplate. It's 900 degrees Fahrenheit on Venus, hotter than a pizza oven. Every day, Mars is bone dry and colder than ice cold. You've got lightning, you've got storms. All those weather phenomena are ultimately driven by the fact that the temperature differences created by uneven input of sunlight are going to cause motions in the atmosphere. Perhaps the answers to Earth's ultimate fate lie in the great unknown of space. And we're counting down the most extreme weather the universe has to offer. You want to learn about which way our planet can turn climactically? Have a look at some neighboring planets within our own solar system. Scientists know all weather starts with one thing, heat. Heat is a catalyst that creates winds. And there are winds on other planets unlike anything Mother Earth has ever seen. Jupiter is a monster planet. If you add up all the planets together, they would not total the gigantic planet called Jupiter. Jupiter is the planetary amusement park when it comes to windy conditions. Jet streams on Jupiter are pretty cool. Here on Earth, we roughly speaking have about one jet stream per hemisphere. Jupiter is different. Jupiter has about 30 jet streams. These are associated with the cloud bands. Jupiter's jet streams rip around the planet running in opposite directions. Defined by different colors and visible on its surface, these jet streams tear around Jupiter's astounding 1,000 mile thick atmosphere. Earth, in comparison, has only a few jet streams and an atmosphere only 100 miles thick. But why so many jet streams? And why winds at all on a planet that doesn't even get a quarter of the sunlight as Earth? One theory suggests these winds are a direct result of this hot planet just trying to cool itself off. Jupiter is a huge planet over 300 Earth masses, and it formed with a huge, huge amount of heat. And it's so big that it's still trying to get rid of this heat of formation. 
This constant release of heat slowly rises into Jupiter's atmosphere and collides with cooler air. Like Earth and her need to balance hot and cold streams of air in high and low pressure systems, Jupiter also struggles for normalcy. That energy then is used to drive the various storms and winds in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. The jet streams on Jupiter are really ferocious. They go at several hundred miles per hour, and there's a lot of gas zipping along this, this stream. But unlike on Earth, the jet streams are pretty stable. On Earth, it's rare for surface winds to reach over 200 miles per hour. The jet streams on Jupiter reach speeds exceeding up to about 300 miles per hour. That's really fast, and you can't get out. You're trapped inside the jet stream. Traveling through Jupiter's equatorial jet stream would be like a roller coaster ride from hell. It's like this continuous, never-ending roller coaster ride. I love it. Ah! 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 Right you would be pushed up and down by up to 100 miles. Ah! 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 This is huge. Oh, it would lead to a much greater change in pressure than going from the Earth's surface up to the top of Mount Everest. Ah! Jupiter's jet streams are pretty impressive, but 300 miles per hour is nothing compared to our next planet. At first glance, Neptune is the last place scientists expect to find wild weather, let alone vicious winds. Heat is not in abundance on this chilly planet. Neptune is frigid, frigid cold. Neptune only absorbs 0.1% of the sunlight that Earth does. Up until 1989, Neptune was considered, well, boring. Sitting far away from the sun, having an orbit of 165 years, scientists didn't believe much was to be discovered on the blue planet. A visit from Voyager 2 changed all that. As the orbiters zoomed past the planet, scientists were shocked to discover traces of clouds. Most surprising, these clouds were traveling around Neptune at ferocious speeds. Something was carrying them, but wind so far away from the sun? Neptune is the windiest planet in the solar system. Winds blow on the surface of Neptune over a thousand miles per hour. Imagine that, breaking the sound barrier every time you simply look up and the winds blow past you. Scientists estimate winds reach up to 1,500 miles per hour, depending on weather conditions and storms that develop. A major unsolved puzzle in our solar system is the fact that the wind speeds on Neptune are actually much faster than those on Jupiter, despite the fact that Neptune receives only uh, maybe 4% of the sunlight that Jupiter does. This lack of sunlight, or heat, completely contradicts what scientists know about how winds develop here on Earth. You might think that the stronger the sunlight, the stronger the winds would be. This is obviously not true when comparing Earth to Neptune, since Earth's winds are typically maybe 30 miles per hour, whereas those on Neptune reach 900 miles per hour. Scientists suspect there is internal heat left over from Neptune's formation billions of years ago but are perplexed how this internal heat could be enough to drive winds to this speed. There's twice as much heat getting out of Neptune as what the sun is putting in. However, that's not enough to explain the tremendous winds of Neptune. And science has come up with another hypothesis for Neptune's racing winds. A lack of friction might allow these winds to fly uninhibited around the planet. We can be very thankful that there's friction on Earth Friction comes about when the winds are banging into things like trees and buildings and, and terrain, like mountains. So friction ends up slowing down the winds. Like other gas giants, Neptune has no solid surface. Even though the sunlight is extremely weak, if the friction is also extremely weak, then you can build up very fast winds over time. Neptune's winds are the most impressive in our solar system. 
But the universe is a big place, and what is a champion here pales in comparison to weather further out in space. Perhaps the most exciting discovery in planetary science are the most amazing winds we could hope to never experience. If you want to experience the wildest winds in the cosmos, then hot Jupiters are your destination. Hot Jupiters are a class of exoplanets. It's definitely not a place you want to be. It's much, much worse than Neptune. It's much hotter, the winds are much faster. So if you want a nice kind of calm place to set up shop, you'd probably be better off going with Neptune. These guys are definitely much, much worse. Hot Jupiters orbit tightly around their stars, far closer than Mercury to our own sun. And all that intense heat makes for some wild weather. For comparison, it gets about 20,000 times more light from its star than Jupiter does from the sun. The temperatures on these planets are enormous, at between 1,500 and 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Some hot Jupiters are tidally locked, a gravitational effect that leads them to show the same face to their star at all times. You've got one side of this planet that's being just blasted with light from the star all the time, and so you'd expect that to be very, very hot. But at the same time, you've got this night side of the planet that never sees any light from the star. So, you know, perhaps that night side is actually quite cold. Taking hot Jupiter's temperatures, scientists measured how much light is eclipsed from the planet as it passes in front of and behind its star during its orbit. So they actually glow uh, relatively brightly at infrared wavelengths. So if you want to take the temperature of a planet, you want to look at these infrared wavelengths. You want to measure the heat they're giving off. But the temperature difference between the day side and night side was virtually the same. This was astounding considering the extreme situation. Something was transferring the heat from the day side to the night side, but what? Winds traveling at amazing speeds were the answer. And so our models tell us that the winds could be as fast as maybe 6,000 miles per hour. The 6,000 mile per hour winds inferred on some hot Jupiters is much faster than any winds that we know of in our solar system. How fast is 6,000 miles per hour? At that speed, you could travel from New York to Los Angeles in 20 minutes. You've got this incredibly hot day side, and so you've got all this hot gas sitting there on the day side, and sort of what it wants to do is to kind of go rushing around to the night side. Winds are created by hot air wanting to travel to the cold side of the planet. So it's a little bit like a windsurfer. If you come out here on a windy day and you put your sail up, you can really catch a good breeze and you can go flying across the harbor. It's the same thing with these planets. You have such incredibly strong winds that they can really just pick that gas up and whip it all the way around to the night side before it even cools off at all. It's hard to beat weather like that. 6,000 mile an hour winds is about as crazy as you can get with a planet. Scientists have learned to expect the unexpected when it comes to weather in space. Sometimes winds become storms, like tornadoes. And galactic tornadoes are unpredictable and behave in rather weird ways. Recently, a tornado of epic proportions was discovered in space. This space tornado is a herbic harrow object created by winds as the result of a forming star. A herbic harrow object is a glowing cloud of gas produced when a high-speed jet of gas smashes into surrounding, essentially, stationary gas. So this high-speed jet heats the stationary gas and causes it to glow. This object would easily be number one on the list of wildest tornadoes in the universe, except for one important fact. It's not actually a tornado. Its shape is very suggestive of a tornado. It has this helical shape to it that looks like it is twisting along, but it's actually not a rotating object like a tornado. Unlike a tornado on Earth, where a vortex of wind creates a conical shape, this tornado is created by magnetic forces, creating a wake of cosmic dust and particles. This one appears to have sort of a spiral shape within it. 
And that's really kind of weird because most of the others really don't have the spiral pattern. But the cause of the spin is probably different from that of a tornado on Earth. Number two on the galactic tornado list is much more like tornadoes we find at home. And it's a towering presence. They're called dust devils, and they are Mars's answer to a planetary tornado. Dust storms on Mars are pretty cool. There are thousands of local storms that occur every Mars year, meaning dust clouds that are opaque and maybe tens to hundreds of miles across and a few miles tall. Often referred to as the red planet, Mars is a dusty and dismal place. Its surface is covered by sand, Apparently, there is no liquid water on the surface. And in this dusty terrain, when the sun rises, trouble starts. Dust devils can be hundreds of yards wide and a half mile or more tall, spinning 70 miles an hour across the surface. And they have similarities to Earth's own tornadoes. As far as the basic forces inside a dust devil, they're pretty similar to in a tornado. They're both thin vortices that rotate and are low pressure centers. Yet a tornado is much, much stronger, often by an order of magnitude in wind speed. The power of a tornado is undeniable. And scientists at Iowa State University can't seem to get enough of these violent storms. Here, they have built the largest tornado simulator in the world to understand vortex formation. Understanding the power of a tornado on the small scale here might lead scientists to understand these beasts on a grander or even galactic scale. Scientists use dry ice and packing peanuts to observe vortex behavior. There's a six feet diameter fan on top of me, as you can see, which produces the suction and the flow goes up and comes through the outer duct and it's rotating and then the flow converges to the center and again goes up. And as it's going up, it produces the vortex of a certain size which we can control. Combined, these elements perfectly mimic the formation of a vortex as it swells from its base and grows to a funnel. Scientists know that just like tornadoes on Earth, dust devils form from the ground up. Sunlight comes down and heats up the surface, and that heat needs to be convected away by hot blobs of air. As these hot blobs move away from the surface, air is drawn in, and just like an ice skater pulling in her arms, that air spins up, moving faster and faster, and with those higher speeds, kicks dust up into the atmosphere. As this hot blob of air moves away from the surface, the dust devil will become taller and stronger, reaching altitudes of several hundred meters or more, and widths of typically 100 meters, and will get stronger as dust continues to be injected into its interior, and then the dust devil will move off into the distance. However, if a future space colonist was trapped in a Mars dust devil, it wouldn't be fatal. The atmosphere on Mars is very thin, so the wind could be blowing on you and you barely feel it. The pressure on you would be relatively low. So you're not gonna say, oh, what was that? I just got bowled over by a dust devil, but that's not gonna happen. The final galactic tornado event on the countdown is a true mystery, and it turns theories behind tornado formation upside down. The final tornado on the countdown is double trouble. Venus, once viewed as a romantic planet, has some truly horrific weather conditions. Oppressive heat, the greenhouse effect gone amok, this is one planet that is constantly trying to cool itself off with no success. Venus is a fascinatingly hostile place. It's so hostile that even our machines that we send there they work for like a few minutes, and then the components melt. 
As a result of this constant heat, storms are always present on Venus. And this makes for one of the most interesting vortex events ever observed. There's a giant, upside down, twin tornado permanently existing at the pole of Venus. Ever since the Venus Express orbiter sent back magnificent images of Venus, scientists have struggled to understand the twin vortexes running upside down at her south polar region. In a sense, it's an upside down tornado because the air is funneling from the top part of that spiral down towards the ground, whereas a typical tornado on Earth, you think of the air kind of rising up the funnel. And the strange thing is that it's a double vortex. That is, picture two giant tornadoes sort of rotating around each other, and you can see the two lobes, the two halves of it here. Scientists believe the vortexes are a result of heat transfer in the atmosphere. Heat rises at Venus's equator, then sinks at the coolest section of the planet. Like a bathtub draining where the water is, uh, that flow is concentrated on the drain, and it leads to the spinning motion. Why it's a double vortex, we don't really understand that, is still mysterious. This storm is an enormous presence on Venus. It's thousands of miles across. The winds it generates are hundreds of miles an hour. And these vortexes are a permanent fixture on Venus. Weather takes many strange forms in space. Even rain. But other planets have atmospheres made up of different chemicals. In turn, rain is formed from ingredients that would be lethal to humans. And these toxic rains are some of the worst you'll find anywhere in space. Far out past the rings of Saturn lies the second biggest moon in the solar system. Titan. In 2005, the Huygens Cassini probe pierced Titan's atmosphere, landing on its surface. What it discovered was a place with features eerily similar to Earth's. Titan is the only planetary body in the solar system that has seas, like Earth. In fact, I regard Titan as a deranged version of Earth. Scientists were excited to discover mountains, washes, even lakes the size of Lake Superior. And the liquid that fills Titan's lakes and rivers isn't water. It's methane. I wouldn't want to go swimming in one of those lakes. They're liquid methane, which is extraordinarily cold. And that means when condensation occurs on this planet, it rains methane. Rain on Titan isn't an everyday occurrence. In fact, scientists have only witnessed cloud formation a few times. But the evidence is everywhere. Deep washes as a result of significant rainfall. Here we are in Tucson. It hasn't rained for days, and it doesn't usually rain. But occasionally, it rains very strong. And we get a lot of water coming through this wash and eroding this wall. This is the same kind of evidence we see on Titan. Where usually it doesn't rain, but occasionally it produces phenomenal washes. Rainstorms on Titan might be pretty violent. We see lots of erosional patterns on the surface that suggest that some of these storms have been pretty powerful. Scientists believe it takes time for a storm to develop on Titan. And every once in a while, enough clouds build so a rainstorm occurs. So what if we do see a storm here? What would it look like? Well, the big ones are incredible. They would cover the sky from one end to the next. And we would eventually start seeing these very gently falling drops, much slower than the rain that you have on Earth. In fact, everything would seem to be in slow motion. The winds would be a little bit slower and the drops would gently land, and they wouldn't be water, they would be natural gas. Imagine a toxic drizzle with the consistency of waxy crude oil, all at minus 300 degrees. That's Titan. Back 
on Venus, there's never an issue with getting enough heat from the sun. With carbon dioxide forever trapped in the atmosphere, it has a greenhouse effect gone wild. All that heat creates condensation and clouds, thick with sulfuric acid. Here's the irony. Venus is named for the goddess of beauty. The source of the beauty of Venus is one of the most potent acids known to science. In other words, women are not from Venus. There seem to be storms and convection patterns that move around. Um, there are places within those clouds that are very turbulent. Rainstorms on Venus happen 30 miles up from the surface in the cloud beds. And acid rain falls constantly. The thing about the acid rain on Venus is that it literally is battery acid. It's so strong, uh, that acid, that it would, it would eat through skin and do, do very nasty things. So whatever is left of your body would be burnt into a charred piece of powder by the sulfuric acid. But the final rain on the countdown is the most toxic, if not the most dangerous, of all. Throughout the universe, failed stars called brown dwarfs hide in the shadows. While they're more massive than our largest planet, Jupiter, they are so faint, telescopes have trouble detecting them. A brown dwarf is a failed star. It's a wannabe. It's a ball of gas that never quite made it. You have to have a certain amount of gas before you get ignition, and you get a beautiful star emerging. A brown dwarf just didn't make it. Despite being a failure as a star, temperatures on brown dwarfs are still pretty impressive. At over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And unlike stars that are too hot to have weather, brown dwarfs have cooled enough to experience convection and condensation. At these temperatures, rain takes on a whole new terrifying meaning. Deep in the atmosphere of a brown dwarf, it's so hot that even iron is a vapor, it's a gas, like water is in our own atmosphere. As iron vapors rise up, they cool, solidify, and turn to sand. And the iron would start to condense, and you'd have clouds, big puffy clouds, except the clouds would be sand, boiling hot, 1,500 degrees. Because in a brown dwarf, you have something the size of Jupiter, but you've packed in 30 or 40 or 50 times the mass of Jupiter. The gravity is very high. It could be as high as 300 times the gravity we have on Earth. And so things can fall a lot faster. The high moving velocity of the sand blaster makes it a pretty good analogy for sand in a brown dwarf. In the atmosphere of a brown dwarf, the gravity is 300 times what it is here on Earth. And these little sand grains in the clouds will be falling at 70, 80, 100 miles an hour. It'd be a lot like the sand coming out of the sand blaster. This sheet of stainless steel has been warped by the force of the sand blaster. You can imagine the iron rain in the atmosphere of a brown dwarf coming down at 100 miles an hour, what it might do to a sheet like this. These drops of liquid iron, maybe 2,800, almost 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, these drops can really start falling at high velocity, 50, 80, 100 miles an hour. So you can imagine your umbrella would be torn to shreds by this hail of, of molten iron. It'd be a real rainstorm from hell. This has got to be the worst weather in the universe. Heat, convection, condensation. The elements of weather. Alone, they cause spectacular rains, supersonic winds, and heat on other planets. Combine them, and incredible storms are formed. The storm needs a temperature difference. On Earth, every storm is a result of uneven heating by the sun. The easiest example is the ocean is colder than the land. Hurricanes, cyclones, and vortexes are the great wonders of weather on Earth. but also in space. And 
Unlike Earth, where storms last hours or perhaps a few days, some storms in space can last centuries. These hurricanes would make our hurricanes on Earth look like a summer breeze. Neptune has the fastest winds in the solar system. But it also has a great dark spot, a mysterious hurricane-like storm that appears and disappears with no warning. It flies around the planet counterclockwise. Discovered by Voyager 2, it's big with black and blue features. It appears to be a fierce storm about the size of Earth. Scientists don't know what causes it to form or why it's black. It's a mystery, like another storm in our solar system. Saturn is famous for its magnificent rings, but is a little mysterious when it comes to its atmosphere. But sit back and wait 30 years, and Saturn will put on a storm so magnificent it would impress Mother Nature herself. It's called the Great White Spot, a gigantic storm that develops every 30 years on Saturn's surface, eventually covering the entire equator. This is truly a planetary scale phenomenon, and we think it's a monstrous, monstrous thunderstorm. Scientists have observed the storm developing at Saturn's equator, where it receives the most heat from the sun. Perhaps heat builds over time and finally bursts into a storm on a planet that has no surface or friction to slow it down. In other words, it's sort of like a vicious circle where once you get the ball, the ball rolling, it just rolls down the hill and you know the storm goes global. Months later, the storm runs out of energy, only to lie dormant for another 30 years. What the cause or time scale means, scientists truly don't know. But Saturn's great white spot is not as powerful or everlasting as our biggest storm in the solar system. Jupiter has long been a source of fascination for scientists when studying wild weather in space. And its great storm has been a feast for the eyes for centuries. Jupiter is the giant of our solar system, dwarfing all other planets. So it's only fitting its weather also becomes a showpiece of sheer force and incredible size. In 1664, the astronomer Robert Hooke noticed something strange about Jupiter. There was a pimple there, which we now call the Great Red Spot. It's been stable. Think of it. A planetary storm, several times the size of the Earth, stable since 1664. This is one of the amazing features of our solar system. The Great Red Spot was named that long before we knew what it was, because you can see it from a telescope on Earth. And so for hundreds of years, people have known about this Great Red Spot. The Great Red Spot is the most impressive storm of our solar system. And it's been churning for at least 300 years. The mother of all hurricanes in our solar system is actually on Jupiter. It's not technically a hurricane, but it behaves very much like one. It has a heat source, it has swirling winds, but it dwarfs anything on our planet. This storm is so big, you could take two Earths and stick them right inside the storm. The winds are blowing at 300 miles an hour. Both hurricanes and the Great Red Spot are giant vortices. In the case of hurricanes, they're a low pressure center. The Great Red Spot is a high pressure center. In both cases, there are high speed winds circling the vortex. Like a giant eye, the storm continuously circles Jupiter. Wind speeds reach 400 miles per hour. And the giant red spot never seems to dwindle in strength. Powered by the internal heat of Jupiter, it also eats anything in its path. 
If you're a small vortex and you're in the path of the Great Red Spot, look out, you're gonna be gobbled up like a little fish. Scientists believe the lack of friction or surface on Jupiter might allow this storm to churn uninterrupted for centuries more. On Earth, because of the strong friction, when hurricanes hit land, they tend to fall apart in just a few days. On the other hand, the Great Red Spot has a lifetime of over 100 years. We don't really understand this in detail, but it probably means that the friction in Jupiter's atmosphere is very weak compared to an Earth's atmosphere. Jupiter is a good example of a, of a planet where the planet itself is what's supplying at least some of the energy to drive a storm that's lasting for, for centuries. Weather, the state of an atmosphere throughout the universe. Familiar weather events on Earth are played out in fantastic ways on other planets. But why study weather on other planets at all? If you only ever study Earth, for examples to understand Earth, you may be missing a much broader context in which the phenomena that you're trying to describe is embedded. So for example, we look at Earth and we talk about a greenhouse effect. If you want to learn about it, go check it out. Look at Venus. The urge is to believe that all your solutions to your problems on Earth can be found by only looking at Earth. That is short-sighted, bordering on delusional. When we study familiar processes in unfamiliar settings, it really tests whether or not we understand what's happening. In terms of the possibility of life on other planets, the understanding the weather patterns is absolutely key. We're one planet of many. The sun is one star of many. We're in an undistinguished part of the galaxy. There's much to be learned by exploring what others say. existence in a place we call the universe. The biggest things in space are gargantuan beasts. Each one is a heavyweight in its galactic division. The universe is an unimaginably large place. It's so big, it's really hard for human beings to actually comprehend things of these size scales. On Earth and in the universe, size matters. But it matters in different ways. In space, bigger is not necessarily better. And oftentimes, the winners live large and die young. They're the Mount Everests of the cosmos. Astronomers aim their telescopes at them like paparazzi, eager to capture images of their every movement. They are the biggest things in the universe, and their sizes are truly mind-boggling. The good thing about being huge in the universe is that the universe is even huger than you are. So there's plenty of space to stretch out and get your size measured among intelligent civilizations that are having a look. The first thing you find out when you start studying astronomy is how darn big everything is. Almost everything you're studying is so far beyond any kind of human scale that we're ever going to encounter in our normal lives. The universe is brimming with gigantic objects. Within our own solar system, Earth is the fifth biggest planet. But it's a hundred million billion times smaller than the largest stuff in space. So what holds the coveted title as the biggest thing in the universe? Most astronomers agree it's the cosmic web, an endless scaffolding of superclusters of galaxies surrounded by dark matter, an invisible and mysterious form of matter that accounts for 90% of the universe's mass. The largest thing in the universe, you might even wonder if it's a thing at all, it's a web of dark matter that fills the volume of the universe. Dark matter is this matter that we can't even see. It doesn't emit any light, but it is filled throughout the universe and there's structure in it. 
Dark matter is something much more mysterious than most people know. Literally, the stuff that makes me up, dark matter isn't made of that. I don't think you could smell it. I don't think you could touch it. It simply has gravitational attraction. The cosmic web of dark matter becomes visible when looking at the objects that fill it. This cosmic web really is almost like a three-dimensional spider's web. At the very center of all the vortexes, there are the superclusters, clusters of thousands of galaxies. And then filaments of galaxies connect them all the way across the volume of the universe. The deepest, strongest gravity at the intersections of these web-like structures is where all the gas falls. And that's where galaxies form, clusters of galaxies form. But just how big is the cosmic web? If the Milky Way galaxy were the size of a poppy seed, then the observable universe, everything we can see, would be about the volume of the Rose Bowl Stadium. Now that entire volume is filled with the cosmic web, superclusters linked together from one side of the universe to the other. The origins of the cosmic web remain uncertain, but scientists think its initial seeds were planted in the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. During the Big Bang explosion, the whole universe blew up essentially and expanded very rapidly. So the cosmic matter web contains all of the original matter that was created during the Big Bang, just blown up into the very, very large structures that we see today. Scientists are actively trying to map out the cosmic web, which spans the entire universe. One way is to look at hot X-ray emitting gas and how it's contained by the gravity present in the dark matter. Another way is to look at something called gravitational lensing, where light is bent by the gravity of the cosmic web. And so we're able to sort of see the outlines of that cosmic web by the way it distorts the light that's behind it. The cosmic web basically contains everything in the universe. But some scientists question whether it's technically the largest object, because the web isn't continuously connected throughout space. The cosmic matter web is not actually the largest gravitationally bound object in the universe because all the matter in the universe has expanded so vastly, the force of gravity is not enough to keep it together in one area, whereas superclusters of galaxies are actually gravitationally bound, meaning that they have enough mass to produce enough gravity to hold them together over the passage of time. Astronomers don't have a firm estimate, but the cosmic web could be made up of hundreds of thousands of supercluster complexes. These are mega collections of galaxies, gravitationally bound, up to hundreds of millions of light years across. The universe is organized hierarchically. Stars make up galaxies, galaxies make up clusters, clusters make up superclusters. You could draw an analogy that uh, a cluster might be the North American continent and a supercluster might be the association of cities on the North American continent, cities on the European continent, cities on the Asian continent, etc. The current record holder for the largest supercluster of galaxies is called the Shapley Supercluster. This dense region of galaxies is 400 million light years long. So it would take the fastest interplanetary spacecraft trillions of years to travel across it. The Shapley Supercluster spans several constellations and is almost 650 million light years from our Milky Way galaxy. I have here a small toy boat, which is a replica of the Queen Mary, which you can see here behind me. And this little toy is about 4,000 times smaller than the real Queen Mary. If you could just imagine that our own Milky Way galaxy that we live in is the same size as this toy boat, then one of the most massive superclusters that we know about, the Shapley supercluster, would be the same size as the Queen Mary. So this Shapley supercluster would be about 4,000 times larger than our own Milky Way. It's one of the most massive things we know about in the entire universe. Astronomers have known about superclusters since the 1950s, but now they've determined their origin through recent measurements of the cosmic microwave background, which is actual radiation left over from the Big Bang. It's been concluded that all superclusters, including the Shapley supercluster, originated during the formation of the universe over 13 billion years ago. As the universe evolves and expands, gravity is an attractive force, so any region that has a little extra density there attracts more matter and more matter. So Shapley is a cluster that basically had the accumulation of many other little galaxies falling into it. And that's how it's gotten so big over time. Incredibly, scientists think the Shapley supercluster may be even bigger than it appears. 
In fact, we may only be seeing a small fraction of what's really contained within the Shapley supercluster. When the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer launches, we should be able to see about 10 times farther away, and hopefully we'll be able to see the rest of the Shapley supercluster to see if it is even more massive than what we already know about. Superclusters of galaxies will stay together over time because they're gravitationally bound. Gravity is holding them together, so even though the universe is expanding, over time, those superclusters of galaxies will stay together and they'll always keep orbiting each other. We humans also live in a supercluster complex, but it's less than half the size and about 10 times less massive than the Shapley supercluster. Our Milky Way is part of a small little cluster called the Local Group, which is part of a larger cluster called the Virgo Cluster, sort of on the outskirts of that. So it's like your home address. You live on this street, in this town, in this state, in this country. Similarly, the Milky Way has its larger and larger associations of which it's a part. Superclusters of galaxies are the most crowded neighborhoods in space, but they surround equally big regions where almost nothing exists. These bare spots are called voids. Voids are the opposite of clusters. If clusters are where all the galaxies are, voids are where all the galaxies aren't. And you do see this kind of frothy web-like structure of clusters and voids and clusters and voids. So it's kind of like cities and countryside, cities and countryside. The largest confirmed void in the universe remains Bootes. Named after the constellation where it resides, this near empty space is a whopping 250 million light years across. That's equal to 2,500 Milky Way galaxies placed side by side. Look out into the cosmos in any direction and you'll see something, you'll see stuff, you'll see galaxies, you'll see gas, dust, you'll detect dark matter. Everywhere you look, there's something. Yet here's this giant hole with nothing in it. The Boudis void, which was discovered in 1981, is almost completely devoid of galaxies. A new way to search for even larger voids may be possible by precise measurements of the temperatures of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Subtle cold spots in this radiation could locate the directions of large distant voids. The story of their formation is basically the reverse of how superclusters form. The voids must have started out in the first microsecond of the Big Bang as slightly low density regions. But with time, they became less and less dense. All of the matter flowed away into the sheets and filaments, leaving the voids emptier and emptier of matter until today, there's almost nothing but a few little dwarf galaxies in some of these voids. Voids and superclusters are just some of the big things contained in the even larger structure called the cosmic web. But the web also holds other immense objects including colossal bubbles that might hold missing clues to the formation of galaxies. The universe is packed with monstrous things. Researchers have recently discovered giant clouds of gas that resemble something out of a horror movie. These mysterious objects are called Lyman Alpha Blobs. My personal favorite biggest objects in the universe are the Lyman Alpha Blobs unpredicted, unexpected phenomenon where you're catching a galaxy in the first phases of its formation and collapse. A Lyman Alpha Blob is very much like this expanding soap bubble. Except in the case of the soap bubble, it's the air which is making it fill up. A Lyman Alpha Blob is expanding because of heat. A lot of energy has been injected into this gas to make it heat up. And when you put all that energy into a gas, it inevitably tends to puff up and expand exactly like an expanding bubble. In the case of a Lyman Alpha Blob, it's being puffed up by heat and maybe also by the ultraviolet radiation from the newly formed stars. The largest known Lyman Alpha Blob is a colossal amoeba-shaped structure that resembles a giant green jellyfish. It's 200 million light years wide and is located in the constellation Aquarius. When we're looking at the Lyman Alpha Blob, we're seeing gas that's sort of spread amongst these very first stars and galaxies. It's kind of an amorphous shape of about 30 separate little blobs inside of it. It's very large and very massive. The whole structure is about 3,000 times the size of our own Milky Way galaxy. The Keck and Subaru telescopes in Hawaii 
contains special filters that are able to see this faraway blob, which spreads out along curvy tentacles. Scientists estimate that the largest Lyman Alpha blob was formed about 12 billion years ago, almost 2 billion years after the Big Bang. The observational technique we use to see that gas, it refers to a very specific color of light, emission of light, that's called Lyman Alpha. So you hear a phrase Lyman Alpha blob because if you take an image of the sky through a filter that gives you only that Lyman Alpha light, that very special wavelength of light, you'll see a little blob on the sky. Lyman Alpha blobs are perhaps precursors to the galaxy clusters we see today. Within these gigantic bubbles may exist cocoons that will one day spawn new galaxies. The Lyman Alpha blobs are probably a fairly special short-lived phase in the evolution to creating a galaxy. I would expect that most of them are going to collapse and form young galaxies in the next 100 million years or so of their lives. So it's a special phase just when a galaxy is beginning to pull itself together. The search of the universe for Lyman Alpha blobs is just beginning. We'll undoubtedly find many more of them and even perhaps some larger ones in the future. Stay tuned. Lyman Alpha blobs may hold the answers to the formation of individual galaxies, which are gravitationally bound systems containing stars, gas, dust, and dark matter. At least 100 billion single galaxies exist in the observable universe. They range in size from 10,000 to millions of light years across. Galaxies, these titanic collections of stars, I think of them as cities, having been born in one myself. Not only a galaxy, but also an actual city, a native of New York where everyone is crowded together. Galaxies are sort of how matter has organized itself in the universe. In the competition for largest single galaxy in the universe, sizing up a winner is challenging. The problem in saying what's the largest galaxy is in deciding where they end. The galaxy does not have a sharp edge. It just gets thinner and thinner as you go further out. It's exactly analogous to saying where's the end of a very large metropolitan area. Where's the end of Los Angeles? You can go out 50 miles and you'll still find a fairly high density of suburbs. The suburbs of a big galaxy like the Milky Way extend out very, very far, more than 100,000 light years. And with a giant galaxy, those suburbs extend out hundreds of thousands of light years. Since scientists can't determine a clear winner, several galaxies share the title as biggest. They're called cluster diffuse, or CD galaxies. And they sit in the centers of rich clusters of galaxies. If you think about the cosmic web as being sort of like a three-dimensional spider web, well, then the spiders lurking in the middle of the web are these monstrous CD galaxies, as we call them. These galaxies can have masses that are, in some cases, maybe 10 times or 20 times the mass of our own Milky Way. These CD galaxies are the largest galaxies in the universe. For example, IC 1101 sits in the center of a galaxy cluster called Abel 2029, and it's 6 million light years across. Compare that to our own Milky Way, that's 100,000 light years across. It's a really big galaxy. It's 60 times the size of our Milky Way. CD galaxies are elliptically shaped, as opposed to a disk structure like our Milky Way. This is because they've achieved their size by bulking up on other galaxies through galaxy mergers. You may have heard the phrase galaxy cannibalism, where one galaxy eats another. That goes on all the time in clusters of galaxies. So sitting usually down at the very center of a massive cluster, you'll find one big galaxy. These CD galaxies have so much mass that they are the 800-pound gorilla wherever they are. You see little galaxies maybe orbiting around them, but basically it's eaten up everything nearby. The largest galaxies may be 6 to 20 million light years across. However, there are other objects even larger. They're called radio lobes. Stretching out from both sides of a galaxy, these immense structures are actually hurling jets of charged particles that emit radio waves. So we're here in this auto body shop where I'm going to use these two torches to simulate radio jets coming out of opposite sides of an accretion disk swirling around a supermassive black hole. So in the visible, you see a small blue flame coming off of the torch. But in the infrared, you can see that the heat from the torch extends much, much further out. 
Similarly, with the radio jets, what you see in the optical is actually quite different from what you see in radio waves. A typical lobe might be 160,000 light years as the lobe spreads out on both sides of the galaxy. That's about twice the size of the Milky Way galaxy's disk. Astronomers think radio lobes are powered by supermassive black holes located in quasars. These are the luminous centers of most active galaxies. The jets of radio energy that come from a giant black hole and make these enormous radio lobe structures are very closely related to quasars. In fact, in some cases, you can see a low-power quasar in the center of the galaxy, and then it's surrounded by these giant lobes to either side. They've been blasted out by very high-energy jets of electrons that are basically moving at almost the speed of light. And they are blasted out, probably from the north and south poles of a spinning black hole. The radio lobes depend on matter going down the black hole. As matter goes down the black hole, some of it gets accelerated up into these lobes. So the size of the lobes has something to do with the history of how much matter the black hole is actually fed on. And so over time, they'll change size. Radio telescopes have surveyed the universe and determined the largest known radio lobe. The undeniable record holder is located in the galaxy named 3C236, which is in the constellation Leo Minor. Its jets span 40 million light years across. Scientists don't understand why some active galaxies form these jets and others don't. But one thing's certain, radio lobes will not last forever, perhaps for only a few million years. So just as this torch will eventually run out of gas and shut itself off, the jets from a radio galaxy will eventually die as well. When the black hole has consumed all of the material in its immediate vicinity, there'll be nothing left of the accretion disk to get shot out along the magnetic field lines, and the jet will die. If black holes are the producers of these gigantic radio lobes, then what is the largest black hole in the universe? Scientists are currently placing bets on the winner. When it comes to the biggest things in the universe, some black holes earn a place in the record books. A black hole is a region of space where the pull of gravity is so immense that nothing can escape it, not even light. There are billions upon billions of these black monsters prowling the universe. They come in two size categories. Most of them are the stellar mass black holes, which are about five to a hundred times the mass of our sun. And then there are the supermassive black holes that are millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. We have the supermassive black holes, the kind that we seem to be finding in the centers of every galaxy where we've had the resources to look. Havoc is wrought upon your environment if you're a star orbiting close to one of these supermassive black holes in the centers of these galaxies. Black holes are not physically large regions. But when measuring their mass, they become top competitors in the galactic heavyweight division. The center of our Milky Way, we know that there's a black hole that's about maybe three million times the mass of our own sun. And yet, because black holes are so incredibly dense, the actual size of the black hole is still fairly small, but incredibly, incredibly powerful gravitationally. As their name suggests, these black beasts are essentially black because no light can escape them. So one can only be observed when its gravity affects something else in space, such as a passing star, or when it's gorging on matter around it. So what is the reigning black hole champion? The current record holder for the largest black hole appears to be in the incredibly luminous quasar, which has the prosaic sounding name HS 1946 plus 7658. Why do I say it's the largest black hole? because we know it is the most luminous quasar in the universe that's been found so far. The black hole that's holding it together, that's producing the energy, needs to be about 10 billion times the mass of the sun. That corresponds to a black hole which is larger than our entire solar system. In fact, it's just out there to remind us how bizarre a seemingly simple force like gravity can actually be. The largest supermassive black hole wields power in the center of a galaxy. But there are other big luminous objects in the universe. In fact, there are some that seem to exist everywhere we look. 
When we glance into the nighttime sky, we see stars, twinkling dots of light that are actually luminous balls of plasma. Although they may seem small from Earth, stars come in a variety of sizes, from red dwarfs, which are about one twelfth the mass of our sun, to blue-white supergiants that can get as big as 150 solar masses. Our Milky Way holds 100 billion stars, including our sun, which is over 300,000 times the mass of planet Earth. And this cosmic beacon is a literal powerhouse in our solar system. This natural gas power plant produces about 300 megawatts of power. Now that's enough to power a few hundred thousand homes, but that's only a tiny fraction of our sun's energy output. The sun's power is about two billion billion times the amount of this plant. So even in spite of its distance, the sun is able to warm our entire planet. Even so, our sun isn't the largest or the most powerful star by a long shot. The most powerful stars are about a million times as powerful as the sun. So if you wanted to compare that with the Hoover Dam, you would need 30 million million Hoover Dams per person on the planet to generate that much power. There's really no human scale to imagine this power output. The largest and most powerful stars that produce this kind of energy are called red hypergiants. That's a class of stars that's even larger than supergiant stars. So typically stars like our sun are fusing hydrogen into helium to make their energy. But hypergiant stars have already exhausted all the hydrogen in their core, and they're fusing hydrogen into helium in the outskirts around the core, and that makes them extremely hot and energetic, and all that energy causes the star to swell up. And so it star ends up with a very large surface area, surface areas of the size of the Earth's orbit are even bigger. Within the hefty field of red hypergiants, Phi Y Canis Majoris appears to have the largest diameter. It's 2,000 times wider than our sun, and consequently, it would take the world's fastest race car 2,600 years to circle it once. This stellar champ lives about 5,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Canis Majoris. If you replace the sun with VY Canis Majoris, if you put this hypergiant star where the sun is, its radius would extend out past Saturn's orbit. It'd be about nine times as far from the sun as the Earth is. So this is a much broader in diameter star than our sun is. Astronomers determine the radius of such a large star by looking at its temperature. We use measurements of the temperature of the star's surface, which we can get from the color of the star. And then we will also measure the total power output or luminosity of the star. And by combining those, we can determine what the total surface area is of the star. And from that, we get its diameter. Now, that assumes that you can measure its luminosity fairly well and that you know something about its temperature from its color. Most of the time, they just simply appear as pinpoints of light, and it's impossible to actually resolve it. Although there are new instruments now called interferometers, which are capable of resolving even very tiny point sources, like stars. And in some cases, there have been direct measurements of stellar diameters. VY Canis Majoris will not be a title holder forever. The red hypergiant is losing mass at the rate of almost 30 Earth masses or more per year. The largest stars in the universe, like VY Canis Majoris, are actually dying stars. That as stars begin to die, they burn their nuclear fuel much less stably. They puff out over time. VY Canis Majoris is probably only a few million years old. Stars that are as massive as it is don't live very long. They use their fuel up at prodigious rates. Then they swell up into this hypergiant state and only live there for a few hundred thousand years, a very short time scale, and then rapidly explodes. Phi Y Canis Majoris might have the largest diameter, but when it comes to possessing the most mass, there's another star that tips the scale. In the wide world of stars, there are many contenders vying for the title as the largest in the universe. But when it comes to stars, big can mean two different things. When you talk about the biggest star, you can mean one of two things. You can either mean the star that has the largest diameter, or you might mean what its mass is. The mass is a measure of how much stuff you have. It's sort of like your weight when you step on a scale, how much matter your body is made of. According to some astronomers, the most massive star is located in our Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a binary star system known as A1 which is actually two stars that orbit each other once every four days. 
And we find there that one of the stars appears to have a mass at about 115 times the mass of the sun, and the other star is also enormous, about 84 times the mass of the sun. So both stars in this binary are among the most massive stars that we have ever measured. There may be more massive stars than the combination in A1 in this star cluster, but that's the most massive that we've been able to measure directly. These massive stars will live full, but short lives. Massive stars are hugely luminous. Sometimes they can outshine millions of stars in their neighborhood, but at a cost. The cost is they will run out of fuel faster than everybody else. And when they die, they die spectacularly. They explode their guts and scatter it across the galaxy. So the cost of living a high mass life, a high luminous life, the cost of living in the fast lane is that you explode at the end of your life. A bright star may burn out faster and die sooner, but at the same time, those hot stars are cooking up elements that are essential for life. So without really massive stars, we wouldn't be here because you wouldn't get the iron in my blood and the calcium in my bones. All of those things are formed only in the most massive stars. We humans need essential elements from massive stars, but we also need a planet with a firm surface to stand on. Planets come in two size groups, large gas giants like Jupiter and small rocky terrestrials such as Earth. In our own solar system, Jupiter is the largest planet, while Earth trails in fifth place. Yet even though Jupiter reigns supreme in our galactic zip code, it's not the biggest planet in the universe. The largest planet with a well-known radius is called TRES-4, it's named after the Transatlantic Exoplanet Survey that discovered it in the constellation Hercules in 2006. Trace 4 is unusually large for its mass. We can actually directly measure its radius, and this particular planet has an unusually large radius. It's about 70% bigger than Jupiter, yet it has only about 80% of Jupiter's mass. That's about the same density as cork or even whipped cream. If you look at Earth, it's a rocky planet, very dense. And then even the gas giant planets like Jupiter are compressed gas and water and other chemicals, very tightly compressed. This thing, TRES-4, is like a marshmallow. Although TRES-4 is light for its size, it's about 18 times larger than Earth. Scientists aren't exactly sure how TRES-4 got so large. One theory is that the planet's extremely close distance to its parent star is cooking up a lot of chemicals in its atmosphere, which is trapping heat, much like greenhouse gases. This particular planet is only about 5% of the Earth's sun distance from its parent star, so it's very, very close. In fact, so close, it orbits its star every three and a half days. So you can imagine how hot and how just blasted with sunlight this thing must be. Because the planet can't cool off, it can't shrink because when it's very hot, when gases are very hot, they expand. So this might be contributing to keeping the radius of this planet so very large. TRES-4 may be a puffed up planet, but when it comes to sustaining life, bigger planets don't offer prime real estate. These giant planets really are just gas. There's no solid structure to them at all. There's nowhere to stand on them. So it's not a very likely place to find life because life would have to continually be blown around in the atmosphere. And that's a hard thing to evolve from. This planet would not be a very habitable place because it's so close to its parent star. It's getting blasted with radiation from its sun. So it would be a very hot and unpleasant place to be, at least for humans. TRES-4 currently has the largest known radius. However, the planet could be bumped out of first place in the near future. Scientists are finding new planets basically every day almost at this point. So it's quite possible that we will find another one that's even bigger than this particular planet any time. In addition to planets, scientists are also discovering new asteroids all the time. These are rocky bodies that didn't become planets. And the largest one may exist in our galactic neighborhood. In our own solar system, billions upon billions of leftover rocks that didn't become planets take refuge in the asteroid belt. Some are as small as grains of dust, and others are the size of nations. Ceres was the first asteroid ever discovered, and it remains the largest known asteroid to date. 
Named after the Roman goddess of plants and harvest, Ceres is about 600 miles in diameter, so it's almost as large as the state of California. Ceres is so big that it contains 25% of all the mass in the asteroid belt. Ceres is so big that if you took all the other asteroids in the asteroid belt and glued them all together, they'd only be about two or three times bigger than Ceres. Ceres' size sets it apart from the rest of the rocks in the asteroid belt. It would take the Apollo lunar rover 10 days to drive around the asteroid at eight miles per hour. But in addition to its size, its other distinct feature is its round shape. We have all these Idaho potatoes orbiting in the asteroid belt of the solar system, most of which are craggy chunks of rock. Ceres is large enough, massive enough, that its gravity has overcome the strength of the rocks that contain it. And any time that happens, the shape becomes a sphere. Because of its round shape, Ceres now holds a dual title. The current definition of a dwarf planet is something that, in fact, is massive enough and has enough self-gravity to form itself into a round shape. And in fact, since Ceres is round, we also call it, in addition to being an asteroid, a dwarf planet. We know only a little bit about the composition of Ceres right now. We know that it's made primarily of rock, but it may also have water ice, and in fact, it could have clay inside it as well. The Dawn mission is actually going to go to Ceres and enter into orbit around it, and they'll bring a whole suite of instruments to bear on it, so we should learn a lot more about the composition of this unusually large asteroid in our own solar system. Ceres may be the largest asteroid in our solar system, but it's a big universe out there. It's quite possible that as we go on to exploring other solar systems outside of our own, that we may in fact someday find an asteroid larger than Ceres. Our solar system contains some oversized objects. The largest planet, Jupiter, has the biggest moon, named Ganymede. Planet Mars actually contains the largest volcano, called Olympus Mons. It's 17 miles tall, which makes it about three times taller than the biggest volcano we have on Earth. It's so tall that if you stood at the base of Olympus Mons, you wouldn't be able to see the top due to the curvature of Mars itself. So in our own solar system, the biggest things definitely have had a powerful shaping effect on, on the universe. One might guess that the sun would take top honors as the largest thing in our cosmic suburb. It's a thousand times more massive than Jupiter. But is there something bigger? The largest object associated with our solar system is the Oort cloud. And this is a very diffuse cloud of comets that literally extends about halfway out to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is about four light years away. Astronomers estimate it would take the space shuttle hundreds of thousands of years to travel around the outer edge of the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is so dark and so distant that we really can't directly observe it. But what we do know is that comets come in from every direction on the sky. So there must be a spherical cloud of comets far away from us. The origins of the Oort cloud remain puzzling. One theory is that it was formed early in our solar system. As comets fell in towards the forming sun, they were ejected into long orbits. Over time, their orbits threw them out into a giant cloud. It's very far away, and it's filled with icy remnants that have just been left in basically the same state that they were from right around the time when our solar system formed about four and a half billion years ago. So they are, you could say, the archaeological remnants of the formation of our solar system. The universe is comprised of things both big and small. But it's the large structures in space that challenge our understanding how the universe works. Although astronomers have found many substantial objects, the quest to find even larger ones continues. Astronomers are hoping to find new large planets, new huge superclusters, and learn more about the things that we've already seen. As technology improves with better telescopes, better detectors, newer surveys, we will be able to see farther into space and therefore hopefully discover even bigger things than we already know about.